We look at the health of coral reefs, specifically in Puerto Rico, and how a dredging project there could harm corals. And we're joined by two guests, and they are Rachel Silverstein, the executive director and waterkeeper of Miami Waterkeeper, and Stetson University College of Law professor Jacqueline Lopez. She's the director of Stetson's Jacobs Public Interest Law Clinic for Democracy and the Environment. I want to welcome you both to Tuesday Cafe. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. And I'll, we'll get to Puerto Rico and the corals there and the dredging project that's planned there in just a moment. But let's talk about your organizations. First of all, Rachel, can you tell us what is Miami Waterkeeper? Absolutely. Miami Waterkeeper is a nonprofit working in Miami-Dade and Broward County. Um, and we work to protect the water, the environment, and the community and to make us the most resilient city in the world. Um, and we have spent a lot of time working on coral reefs because my background um, is in coral reef ecology. Thanks. And, and Jacqueline, what is this Jacobs Public Interest Law Clinic for Democracy and the Environment? Is this an, an, a new um, or, uh, entity at Stetson Law? Yeah, that's right. So the Jacobs Law Clinic is a public interest law clinic, and we take on clients in the space of the environment and democracy. So we provide the work pro bono, and we use law students at the university who have an interest in this area of law to give them access to developing these skills while they're still in law school, while also providing this public benefit for our communities. And so in this case, we took on helping out prepare the amicus briefing for the lawsuit in support of the corals in Puerto Rico. Yeah, and that's what we'll be talking about for the next half hour or so are these, these corals in Puerto Rico and how you're telling us that this dredging project may potentially injure these corals and coral reefs in Puerto Rico. And we uh, there's a lot of background on this because of some dredging projects in Florida. And so we're going to get to all of that this hour. So first, maybe Rachel could give us some background about what is being proposed in Puerto Rico. Where is the dredge? Where would the dredging be? And what's that environment like? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the story actually, funnily enough, starts in Miami um, and our, our background and history on the potential risks of dredging around coral reefs starts in Miami. And I just wanna make sure you can hear me okay as well. Sound great. Um, I know I've got and some ocean background noise behind me. So we'll take that. And you're joining us from the, the, the Dominican um, Republic, I understand. Yes, I, I am. I'm uh, at a conference here. Well, um, yeah, no, thanks for having us. So in Miami from 2013 to 2015, uh, the Port of Miami deepened and widened its shipping channel. Um, and that was to, let in these supersized post Panamax ships. Um, but the shipping channel is uh, very shallow and it goes both inside of Biscayne Bay and in, in the interior of, of Miami um, and also out offshore on the coral reef. And it actually crosses the coral reef that runs um, north to south along Florida's coast. Um, and when they were doing that project, they were only supposed to harm some corals in the actual expansion area of the channel where they were literally deleting some of the reef. And what ended up happening is that they illegally dumped sediment over um, what is estimated now we know to be at least 278 acres of coral reef right off of Miami Beach um, that is killed that has never been fixed um, and was not supposed to be harmed in this project. Um, so we learned a lot of lessons going through um, that project, and we filed a lawsuit against the Army Corps of Engineers for Endangered Species Act violations. We got some of the corals repaired, but we're now working really to get all of the likely millions of corals that were killed in that 278-acre area in Miami. So as we're working on this project, um, it came to light um, that the Center for Biological Diversity was challenging a similar dredging project that was occurring in San Juan Harbor. Um, and we've been lucky enough to work with Jackie and her team on uh, participating and helping bring some of the lessons learned from this disastrous outcome that happened in Miami to San Juan Harbor. Um, and what we know, for example, there's one example um, that they didn't look at what happened in Port Miami um, when they were considering um, potential impacts for San Juan Harbor. They just said, oh, it's a different situation, so we don't need to even look at it. Um, and so they basically ignored all of the things that went wrong and are repeating the same mistakes. 
And we'll talk about some of those things that you think might be repeating mistakes and why it would be worth at least protecting the corals or monitoring the corals and, and possibly even stopping the dredging project as we go through this interview. So uh, let me ask you, what does describe, most of our listeners probably have not been to the port of San Juan. Uh, what does all that look like? What's what's the geography around there? What's the water like? What's inside the water? And what are the people like around that area? Jackie, you want to jump in or? Sure. So the port is on the north side of the island and it's near the largest city in Puerto Rico. So it's a pretty urban industrialized area. Um, the majority of the people that live in the area, of course, identify as Hispanic and particularly in the area most adjacent to the dredge project. It's something like 99% according to census data. Even though it's the most industrialized space on the very small island, it's still teeming with biodiversity. So specifically the coral that we're concerned about here, there are seven different species of coral that are adjacent to and nearby and actually have federally designated critical habitat very close to both the dredge area as well as the area where the sediment, the material that gets dredged up would be transported away from the channel. And so all of that is in and among and around coral and their habitat. So it's a really, um, it's a vibrant, vibrant place. And um, like many other places that have a lot of biodiversity, everything is interconnected. And so we want to be very careful when we're disturbing one aspect of the environment, particularly the marine environment and coral and coral reef systems, because we know that they support so many other species and are so important for the near shore um, the, the livelihood of the people that live there, the aesthetic value, and then the intrinsic inherent value of just having life that is undisturbed by human activity. That's Jacqueline Lopez, a Stetson University College of Law professor and the director of Stetson's Jacobs Law Clinic. We also are hearing from Rachel Silverstein, a PhD, the executive director and waterkeeper of Miami Waterkeeper. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're talking about a proposed dredging project in Puerto Rico that they say will harm corals there. So if this project is, if this uh, port is dredged, and the, the reason, as you said earlier, is to allow larger ships to come through. And some of those ships, it would allow large tankers that fuel two power plants to eventually switch from diesel to liquefied natural gas. Uh, there's it's uh, from reading your amicus brief, it sounds like you have a lot of issues with that. But what are some of the issues of allowing these ships to come in to fuel these power plants switching to LNG? The amicus briefing, which is just a Latin way of saying friend of the court briefing, was done in support of an appeal to the DC Circuit. So there's already a lawsuit moving forward that um, has Center for Biological Diversity, Correlations, and a local group, El Puente de Williamsburg. The briefing that we brought was in conjunction with Vermont Law School representing local communities that are, are making arguments that they are suffering an environmental injustice as a result of the dredge project. And their arguments are that the Army Corps wants to expand this channel arguably to improve traffic conditions. But the other benefit would be allowing additional LNG or liquefied natural gas tankers to come through to fuel two power plants. And the concern with that is that it disrupts Puerto Rico's intention to move to more renewable resources. LNG, this natural gas, this fracked gas is devastating in terms of its greenhouse gas impacts and its indirect impacts there through, thereby through coral. So for example, staghorn and um, elkhorn coral, which are two of the seven species we're really concerned about, were listed by the National Marine Fishery Service, oh gosh, almost, almost 20 years ago now. And they were the two species to first be listed under the Endangered Species Act due to impacts from climate change. And so by, ironically, by creating this space to allow additional um, fuel tankers to come through to transition to a gas that's going to be just as bad for, for greenhouse gases and just as bad for climate change and just as bad for coral. And Dr. Silverstein can describe some of the impacts coral suffer as a result, not just from the dredging and the sediment, but also from climate change. 
Um, and those are the concerns that that those groups are bringing in addition to the concerns that the Jacobs Law Clinic uh, represented with its two clients with respect to the direct dredge impacts to coral. Yeah, you talked about the renewable energy goals for Puerto Rico. It's actually a law, the um, energy and climate goals, 100% renewable by 2050. That's Puerto Rico Energy Public Policy Act, which certainly uh, building new liquid liquefied natural gas plants to, to power energy 26 or whatever it is years before that goal has to be reached is is really not moving in the right direction toward, toward making that law reality. So let's, <clears throat> excuse me. Excuse me, let me ask uh, Dr. Silverstein about the idea of shipping like sulfur and nitrogen emissions. What can that, how would that impact? If there's more shipping, how would that impact acidification and nutrient loads, and, which would harm corals and other marine life? Yeah, so I think, and, and I, you know, it's always important to remember, why do we need corals? Some people, they may never see corals. They may never visit a reef, um, but reefs really do affect all of us, especially folks living um, on islands like um, like in Puerto Rico. And coral reefs provide homes to 25% of all marine life. So if we lose those corals, we lose 25% of marine life. This provides protein for millions of people every single day around the world. So it's a critical food source. Um, in addition to that, corals reduce about 95% on average of wave energy during things like storms. So as we're looking for solutions to make communities more resilient, um, we have these natural coastal barriers already in place when in these areas that are next to coral reefs. So having healthy, thriving coral reefs that can protect coastlines from storm surge and erosion is absolutely vital, particularly moving forward in an area of potentially um, more intense storms from climate change. So what is really killing corals, um, the first and most important thing is climate change. Um, that is causing increased ocean temperatures and ocean acidification, and corals cannot survive in either of those conditions. And my PhD is actually in looking at uh, the effect of high temperatures on corals and how to make them more resilient and more able to survive in high temperature conditions. Um, and this summer, we had off the charts doesn't even describe the kind of temperatures we saw in the Florida Keys, like chart shattering um, temperatures and corals just could not survive. And so um, we lost some estimates have about 99% um, of the staghorn and elkhorn coral that Jackie mentioned from the Florida Keys. And that's been a species of coral that used to be the dominant coral species. It created miles and miles and miles of this really important habitat. And it's kind of shaped like um, a deer antler, and it provides habitat for fish to live in and around safely. Over 98% of it had declined. That's why it was listed um, as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and now we're seeing it further wiped out as well as elkhorn coral um, that may now be even extinct from the Florida Keys. But those two species were the subject of a lot of outplanting and restoration efforts over the last several decades. And so some people saw decades of work, their life's work, restoring these corals one by one back out onto the reef, wiped out in a matter of one week this summer in July. Um, so we, we really are seeing this ecosystem start to collapse in the Florida Keys and in other places as well. We know that this is coming. Um, and so that's a global impact, a, a very large scale issue that it's hard to feel that, you know, you can have control over as a, as a local community, even though, you know, we all have an impact. But then we have, in conjunction with the threats that corals are facing from global climate change, these very local impacts that are totally preventable, um, like these dredging projects that are simply not using the best available science to protect reefs while they're, they're dredging and bringing in this commerce into ports. They could also be making sure corals are not killed. Um, and that's really what we're asking for here is to learn the lessons to make sure we're protecting corals where we can, given the global threats that they're facing and the the extreme importance of corals to our communities. That's Rachel Silverstein, PhD, the executive director and waterkeeper of Miami Waterkeeper. We're also speaking with Stetson University College of Law Professor Jacqueline Lopez, the director of Stetson's Jacobs Law Clinic. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're talking about protecting coral reefs in, in Puerto Rico. 
from potentially from a, a dredging project that could be happening there. And so I wanted to ask Dr. Silverstein about what the impacts of the dredging are on coral reefs. For example, how far away from, from dredging uh, are corals impacted and what types of impacts do, does dredging have? I think you're muted. So sorry. I was trying to drown out the wave noise while you were talking. Um, so there's a couple of impacts that can come from dredging. Um, when you're actually expanding the shipping channel, they are, you know, deleting areas of reef, and that is easier to to quantify and predict. So they can actually move some corals out of that area and and do restoration to make up for those impacts. Um, but what is is harder to do, and what was not predicted, is that. This, the dredging released all of this very fine sediment, almost like concrete powder. And that spread out over the reef and buried the habitat and the corals that were there. Um, so corals need exposed rock to attach to as um, tiny microscopic baby corals called coral larvae. Um, they find the reef exposed rock, they attach to it, they settle, and then they spend their whole lives there. So they can't get out of the way um, of sediment or sand that's, that's being dumped on them. Um, and then we had this you know year and a half or more of everyday sediment being dropped on top of these corals and they were slowly buried over time. Um, but not only the corals and the, and the millions of corals that were likely killed were buried, but also all of that exposed rock that corals need um, to tell um, other corals, hey, this is a reef, you can attach here and we can keep growing. Um, and so that reef area is designated critical habitat um, under the Endangered Species Act because it's so important to protect and to keep as exposed rock for corals to continue to, to thrive. Um, so both the corals were killed and their habitat was destroyed by being buried in dredging sediment. Um, that is also very hard to fix. You can't really get in and um, remove the, um, the dredging sediment easily. Um, you can't get in and vacuum up an area that large. Um, so it takes a long time for the reef to recover. And it does another thing too, which is that all of the nooks and crannies on the reef provide habitat for creatures and critters. Um, and those creatures and critters um, use those little spaces on the reef to hide and to make homes. And when it's totally buried in sediment, it went from um, being a very thriving reef to being basically a moonscape. So when I went diving there next to the dredging, there was so much sediment in the water, you could barely see your hand in front of your face. You could feel the vibrations of the dredge ship. And I initially got in the water and thought that I was in the wrong place, like that this must be a sandbar. But then I noticed that there were little tops of the sea fans and sea whips sticking out from the sand. And those, by definition, have to be exposed to hard rock. And then I started to realize that this was the reef and it had been completely buried and blanketed in sediment and smothered. Um, and I swam as far as I could and I saw no end in sight to the extent of the damage. So to your question, you know, how far did it go? It went, it was supposed to be just a temporary and insignificant impact within 150 meters from the shipping channel. We know that the impacts went out to a thousand meters from the channel, um, if not more. And in Puerto Rico, there are corals in critical habitat um, within that thousand meters, about 450 meters um, away and 700 and, and so meters away respectively. Um, so those corals in that critical habitat in Puerto Rico, we know from what happened in Miami are in, in the direct risk area for being smothered. And longtime listeners of this program will know that we followed a, a condition that's now called stony coral tissue loss disease. We've been reporting on that since 2016. And uh, it's thought that the origin of this disease came from that dredging project in Miami about a decade ago. What do we know about that? And you might be frozen up, uh, Dr. Silverstein. Maybe I, maybe I can ask... Um, Jacqueline, if she knows much about that. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you for- Okay. I didn't hear the whole question, but I turned off my video to see if, if that's better, but- It is. Um, so the, the connection between stony mm -hmm. coral tissue loss disease, a, a devastating disease, and the dredging at Port Miami. Mm -hmm. so that's an excellent question. And um, this disease has killed tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of corals um, throughout the Florida reef tract and now throughout the whole Caribbean. Um, there is 
more and more evidence that this disease may have started at the port of Miami during the dredging and may have actually been accelerated by the dredging uh, at the port of Miami. Um, and if this is true, um, which we don't know conclusively for sure yet, uh, which I think it's important to note, um, that would be absolutely game changing when considering the potential impacts of dredging projects because they have potentially created local extinctions even of certain species of coral. Um, so some of the evidence is, for example, um, a study from NOAA came out that they put healthy corals and diseased corals in the same tank. It took about two weeks for the healthy coral to get the disease. Um, when they did the same thing with sediment in the tank, it took about 24 hours. So it seems to be some kind of a vector that's really speeding up in action um, when there's sediment present. Now, we also have had studies come out um, showing that the only connection in certain disease areas um, is how much exposure to dredging sediment corals have had, and that's actually for the other types of diseases. Um, Can you hear me okay? Um, that that's actually from other types of diseases in places like Australia. So more and more we're realizing that there may be um, connections between the dredging causing you know, a lot of immune compromised corals in one area. This disease potentially existed in the environment um, at very low levels, but then it hit millions of immune compromised corals that had been impacted by the dredging because of the dredging sediment. They were weak. They had you know, little wounds on their tissue that allowed bacteria or viruses in. Um, and really helped spread this disease and turn it into an epidemic um, that then took off like wildfire fire. So the so the prevailing theory is that potentially the dredging served as sort of a spark to set off this disease. Um, but again, research is ongoing. We don't know for sure. But if that connection can be proven, um, that would be really game changing in how we think about these local impacts having potentially global um, effects on these ecosystems. And um, I think it is something that all dredging projects really need to be considering that is not part of the, the current analysis for the dredging at San Juan. There's no disease monitoring being required or anything at all like that. And so we think that that's a big deficiency as well. In fact, there's no monitoring of health, health of coral monitoring at all in this dredge project. So it's almost Correct. like it's, it's, it's if they, um, we won't know necessarily if the dredge goes ahead, we won't necessarily know whether the, the, there is impacts from this dredging project on the corals and coral reefs. That's absolutely correct. So they're taking estimates of 150 meters again, um, even though we've proven that that's not accurate. And then they're saying, oh, because the corals are beyond this 150 meter area, they're they're fine. And they're not even requiring monitoring to make sure that those estimates are correct. And based on what we've seen, we're pretty sure that they're not correct, but we'll never know because currently they're not requiring monitoring. So one of the big asks is, you know, to revise that estimate to truly um, encompass the area of impact that's really likely from dredging projects and their impacts on coral reefs, and then to monitor closely so that we understand the health of corals, um, how much uh, risk they are um, under, and how much sedimentation they're actually experiencing during the project, as well as things like disease that could be going on. You know, I want to take this interesting tidbit from the the filing that you did with the court and you said that the army corps of engineers analyses were written by someone who pled guilty to making false statements to law enforcement agents what is that all about um so when the port of miami dredging project was underway um their chief biologist um a woman named terry uh, jordan sellers was um working on um the port miami projects as well as port everglades um, and I believe San Juan as well. Um, and she was indicted by um, the Department of Justice for lying to federal agents about having taken money from um, an environmental monitoring firm on a major South Florida dredging project. Wow. So uh, pretty interesting stuff. So in the last se few seconds we have, is there anything else that we haven't gotten to that you want to talk about when it comes to the idea of dredging this port near coral reefs in San Juan? Yeah, I think um, we're really asking for lessons to be learned and incorporated. These are the same agencies that made these mistakes in um, in Miami. They have revised a lot of the, these documents because of a lawsuit we filed 
from Port Everglades, which is in Fort Lauderdale, just 30 miles north of Port Miami. Um, and why update and incorporate all of these lessons learned for that project and not San Juan? So San Juan's currently being treated differently. It's being left out and its corals are not being protected. It's using outdated science, faulty analyses, and there's just a complete failure um, to, to live up to the standards that the United States has set for protecting corals um, and their habitats, as well as um, the community and the ecosystem, frankly, around these major dredging projects. So we're just asking that the law be followed here. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Rachel and Jacqueline. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Stetson University College of Law Professor Jacqueline Lopez is the director of Stetson's Jacobs Law Clinic. And Rachel Silverstein, PhD, is the executive director and waterkeeper of Miami Waterkeeper. And I'd also like to thank our earlier guest, the suspended Hillsborough County State Attorney Andrew Warren. If you missed either of these interviews, you can watch them on our website, WMNF.org, beginning this afternoon. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. And you've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. Next up is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. Their guest today is Dr. Sylvia Campbell, who for decades has been serving people who cannot afford medical care. And I want to thank everyone who supported Tuesday Cafe during our recent fund drive. If you'd like the information that you get here, you can help us to make that goal with your donation at WMNF.org. This has been Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on October 17th, 2023 from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. We're all also broadcasting to St. Petersburg, Sarasota, Lakeland, and beyond. Thanks so much for listening to Tuesday Cafe and WMNF.